just a little bit of information uh, about proposed resolutions, if you have any, um, new ones I mean, the ones that were signalled yesterday have gone through to the right place, but if you have any new ones to put up, can you send them to Sharon Bodecker as well as uh, anyone else that you send them to, because she needs to uh, load them, as well as uh, Sandy. So. Now, um, I think we're just going to... Chief, you want to clarify some um, information from yesterday? Just um, on the water renewals issue from yesterday, we spent a little bit of time talking after the meeting about Councillor Van Nevis's grief and why it was so different about the amount of water renewals because we know we're ramping up. And um, uh, uh, Tom Dyer um, picked up on the issue that, um, that uh, Councillor O'Malley raised, which is because you were using the 2015 um, uh, uh, LTP figures rather than the 2018 figures, Councillor Van Nevis, the baseline has substantially shifted because of the additional $30 million that was put in for renewals in South Dunedin. And so that actually massively changes that. I just thought I'd point that out. So if you if you get um, whoever does your graphs for you um, based on the 2018 figures, so from the last long-term plan, you'll find quite a different profile. I'll look forward to seeing the updated graphs. Thank you. Well, you've been given the information. I'm not sure that there are graphs that we've produced. I'm sure no, we didn't produce the one that he used here either. So. so the lesson is to use authoritative sources for your information and then it will be correct. Right, now we're moving on to the uh, community board representatives and can I welcome Scott Weatherall from the Saddle Hill Community Board to kick off. Welcome, Scott. Oh, thanks for having us and um, Happy New Year to all the councillors and, and council staff. Um, well, the last, uh, last year's been pretty huge. I just want to run through a couple of projects that have gone really well for us and, and that's only been because of the collaborative, positive working arrangements that we have with staff and council. Uh, the Green Island Roundabouts have uh, been absolutely instrumental for our community. Um, I haven't heard a negative word about them, so uh, thanks for the work of the transportation team. And also, uh, the reason that obviously happened was the collaborative approach between um, LT and CVA and the Council. Uh, the Brighton, Brighton Road footpath in Brighton, I know Richard hasn't heard too much feedback, but um, it's all been positive, and uh, even just on Sunday for the Brighton Gala Day, we've had some good feedback about that. And um, one of those things that uh, keeps popping up at Freedom Camping, I honestly think that the council have nailed it this time. Um, the, the work that we've got going on out there and um, the infrastructure is, is real, real good. Um, we're at capacity, but we're going to be at capacity because why wouldn't you want to come and camp out on the southern coast? Um, we do continue to get a number of campers uh, from Brighton through to Torrymouth. Um, so how the council want to manage that is, is something f f uh, for further conversation, I think. Uh, we've got a number of layboys that could just be simply maintained with a, a monthly mowing of the grass and some um, tidying up of the driveways. But certainly keen to have a conversation with staff about that further. Um, going forward, uh, we're super excited about a reconditioned toilet from Port Chalmers going to be relocated to uh, Fairfield after 12 years of sort of knocking at the table. We've, we've managed to get that, so that's real good. Um, cycleways, you know, we're, we're no different to anyone else. We're going to continue to get great people coming to cycle in our areas, uh, whether recreational or, or people training or kids. You know, we, we've got to do something, guys, um, about that. Um, We've, we've kind of acknowledged and we've agreed, yeah, okay, we're gonna put some signs up there before Christmas and, and then before the end of January and we come to the end of January and they're not there. So they're gonna happen next week, I understand. So that's awesome. Uh, but that's just a short term fix. So I need to flag that. We need to be looking at uh, cycleways through the Southern Scenic Route and also connecting uh, Fairfield to Mosgiel. Uh, sports fields, gee whiz, I'm not sure what else we can do about this, but uh, holes and mud puddles in sports fields, just not good enough. Really, um, you know, I don't know what else we can do, um, but to hear, again, the Brighton Domain didn't meet the threshold, it will just get regular maintenance. Well, just some decent regular maintenance will be a hell of a start. Um, but it's not just the Brighton Domain, it's a number of other sports fields in and around our areas and I know that the staff know about them. Uh, we've, you guys, just got to put the instruction behind the staff to be able to do the work. 
Uh, coastal erosion, we had a nice chap come and do a bit of a drive around with me about two years ago and it'd be nice to know what the, the council's thoughts are about coastal erosion, how we're going to minimise it or at least manage it. Um, the rural road ceiling budget, once again, I think about you know 10 years ago or something, maybe five years ago, uh, that was removed from the going forward. I would ask the council and the councillors to um, consider the installation or reinstallation of uh, the road resealing budget for rural roads. Um, you know, we've got a growing population at, uh, in our areas, Shane Hills Road, McMaster Road, um, just as the Tauri do and just as everyone else does. But um, those ratepayers deserve a reasonable level of service, guys. Uh, regular repairs and maintenance. Um, interesting that. Uh, Obviously, the Brighton Gala Day, we, we asked for the carriageway to be tidied up and, and looking real good, and it did look real good, you know. The, but to hear the contractor say, oh, we've given a special clean, actually, you've just given it the clean that it deserves on a weekly basis, and nothing more, I'd have to say. Just in concluding, uh, we've had some real cool projects as a board that we've led. Uh, we've got community pantries in each of our communities now, and they've been used on a regular basis, which is real cool. It's just engaging the community back into some pretty old-fashioned kind of, you know, rock up and meet your neighbour kind of thing. It's real cool. Um, we're continuing to work on our community response capability, uh, implementing uh, community response plans for all our areas, uh, working with uh, civil defence, uh, but also regular meetings with our community so they know what's happening. Um, we've put a community toy box at the Brighton Beach, uh, just a large wooden box and put a few toys in there and when the people come to the beach they can grab one of those toys, enjoy it for the day and then pop it back in and, and that's kind of grown to, um, to people donating toys now which is really cool. And our Youth Ambassador Award which we donate uh, from our discretionary fund, so thanks very much for the discretionary fund. Yes, $10,000 is great, a wee bit more counsellor would be great. Um, but at 10,000, we're, we're happy with, you know. Uh, so $1,000 each year we put into our Youth Ambassador Program. And for this last year, we've uh, sponsored uh, Rainbow Rosalind, uh, who's a pretty well known ferry, uh, floats around the area. If you haven't seen her, you can Google her. Um, but she came out to the gala day as well, and, and she's done a number of other community events for us with the community board. Um, so I just want to thank you, uh, appreciating that you're coming to the end of the triennium as we are, but uh, work doesn't stop until sort of the, the day before your election. Um, so all the best for that, but um, thanks for the work that you are doing. Thank you, Scott. Uh, you're happy to Absolutely. take any questions? So, councillors, are there any questions of Councillor Matthews? Good to hear that you've had some good feedback on the roundabouts at Green Island. Um, because they are quite new and quite a major change. Have you had any um, negative feedback or suggestions how things might have been perhaps even done better, like slip lanes or something? No, not at all. It's I think all people are stoked about what we've got. You know, like there was some initial sort of behavioural sort of changes or understanding of, you know, the giveaway to the left and all those kind of things, but uh, it's, um, no, it's going good. And it's had a dramatic improvement in flow through that area. Absolutely, yeah. Right. The traffic was uh, backing up Western Street back onto the motorway. That's gone. <coughs> and also that uh, challenge of coming off the motorway when you're heading north uh, at Abbotsford, that's, uh, that was incredibly frustrating for people. And it's, you know, you've got it, got it dead right there. Great. Well, congrats to... Do you know who actually designed it? Was it NZTA or was it DCC? Uh, Richard Maynard. Both? Well, congratulations all round then. Thank you. Any further questions, councillors? Councillor Gary. Oh, thank you, Scott. Um, and obviously lots happening in your area. Um, I just wanted to pick up on one point you mentioned about somebody going around with you, I think it was around the coastal erosion, to look at it and then you kind of haven't heard anything more. Do you have any comments about that kind of system? What is it you need? Do you need somebody to get back to you? What's missing as you see it? Yeah, I think um, we've fled it a few times now, you know, sort of ahead of the ball to a certain degree, but um, we'd just like to understand what the council's vision or thoughts are around managing coastal erosion. It's a big issue, we know that, but it affects pretty much our whole area other than Fairfield. Um, but it is a big issue, and uh, I think we need to uh, have a pretty clear direction in place. Thank you. And just on the freedom camping, um, Community response this season, how's it been so far? Yeah, incredible, really, really good. Like both the site at Ocean Views at capacity, but actually the 
the way that it's been designed, it, taking some of the vehicles away, but I haven't heard any concerns there. Um, putting some infrastructure there, additional toilets, uh, rubbish bins are ongoing. So that's and, been different to the previous season? Yeah, for sure. The toilets have been, yeah. Brilliant. And at Brighton, uh, for the majority, 99% of the feedback I hear is really, really positive. Um, I had one lady yesterday ask me who's paying for these toilets because we've got additional toilets there now and rubbish bins. Well, Rails is the right pass, but uh, yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> Councillor Elder. Yeah, um, well, the Greater Green Island Network is, is doing great work. And I mean, the reality is it's all about engagement, collaboration with organisations. Not one organisation can do everything. Um, collaboration is the key. And, um, you know, we do a number of combined um, community projects with the, the guys at Greater Green Island. But, you know, the, the work that they're doing in, in regards to the, uh, the Greater Green Island shed and bits and pieces like that, it's, it's good. Um, the other thing is, um, I know you're a keen cycler, and many of us are. I was just wondering what your thoughts are on the coastal cycleway and linking with um, other cycleways, etc. Well, we don't have a formed uh, coastal cycleway. I guess that's what I'm asking for and have been for a wee while now. Um, well, the reality is there's huge potential there to continue to develop from a tourism perspective, ecotourism and all those things. How um, it's going to be not too long before we get some lime scooters out that way as well, you know, and it just makes sense to put lime scooters on cycleways while I'm on it. But um, uh, just seriously, it makes sense. Um, no, I think there's, there's absolutely awesome opportunity to uh, develop further or better cycleways out that way. Thank you. And... Um, I see you've been working really um, closely with Parks and Rec and Transport. What's your feedback on that? Uh, well, like I said right at the start, uh, I think we achieve what we do because of the positive collaboration and cooperation and uh, ongoing regular communications with all the council staff. Um, I, I genuinely think, I mean, don't get me wrong, we, we keep each other honest and I think that's, uh, you know, that's a professional respect for each other. Um, but the communication that we have with all the staff is really, really good. Thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Hey, Scott, how are you doing? Good. Um, a couple of things you mentioned there are fairly large capital items, such as the Southern Cycleway, which will obviously be more of an LTP um, submission question, issue. How did you, so my question is around about submitting to the LTP. How did you feel it went this last cycle, and what would you like to see happen going into the next LTP cycle to make sure that requests such as investigation into a Southern Cycleway become brought yeah, to the top? I think, Councillor, um, the reality is there's an opportunity, and Mr Saunders might be able to get the, the wordings right, but you know, there's the heart Heartland funding. So there's Heartland funding around the development of cycleways that don't meet the, you know, the um, the Crawford Street cycleway. It doesn't need to be that. It just needs to be a safe shoulder. And um, I think, just as we've seen with Great, uh, the Green Island roundabouts, it's collaborative approaches with other organisations to bring these things over the line. So you feel you're happy enough with the mechanism by which your um, requests for these capital investments are being met by the council and being brought into the council works program? Well, I think we put we put things into process. We use the processes that are available. Uh, some things move and some things don't. I absolutely appreciate that you guys are looking at the wider picture, not just yeah a, a couple of communities that we're more invested in. I acknowledge that. So. Uh, I appreciate that you've got to weigh everything up, but I think uh, you know we've got some exciting opportunities that we can continue to work on. Councillor Aldi, you had another question. I just had another question, considering you brought up Hartland Rides, and I note that, do you know that they're actually on the um, regional transport plan as um, opportunities? Sure. Well, we should talk some more with staff about that. Thank you. Further questions, councillors? The run on? Very good. Thank you, Scott. Thank Appreciate you very much for coming in. Cheers. Cheers. Could I now invite um, Paul Pope from Target Peninsula Community Board? Welcome, Paul. Thank you, 
Now, I'll, I'll get you to just press the button in the middle of the mic and bring it round to you. That's it. There we go. How's that? No, it's not going yet. That's it. There we go. How's that? So, uh, thanks for the opportunity to come and speak to the annual plan uh, for the Otago Peninsula. Um, this is really just a real quick summary. Uh, obviously, uh, at the moment, uh, work is progressing from the Glenfellick section to, Vo to Vauxhall with the road widening, and of course, al also with uh, Portobello to Broad Bay. And that has gone very well as a project, and I uh, must say congratulations to staff on the way that they have managed that, along with their contractors. But of course, naturally, uh, other communities or other parts of the community uh, wish to see their sections done, like it's, such as Broad Bay and, and Company Bay as well. So uh, we obviously wish to see that completed. Uh, one of the other aspects of that is also a wider program of footpath and creations uh, and upgrades to those areas as well. And we'll talk about that a little bit further. Um, we still need to deal with the investigation preparation in terms of the Back Bay roads, um, especially in relation to sea level rise caused by climate change. Uh, two floods, 2015, 2017, have been quite severe on that area for that, those people, and those roads during those periods are unpassable. But one of the biggest issues for residential areas is a large portion of residential areas on the peninsula on hill slopes, and almost most of those areas have no footpaths uh, and very little in the way of curb and channel. Uh, the stormwater systems that we have in those areas now are quite primitive, and we are seeing uh, an increase in the number of properties and areas that are actually being flooded, uh, even in uh, minor events at that time. And that's becoming more and more of a regular occurrence. And one of the things I would ask is that we start to look at what our program is for, as I say, increasing and improving the, the, the drainage for those particular areas. And that also includes other areas. Progress was made at Harrington Point and also at Tidewater Drive, but there is going to come a time when some of those areas also too will need greater levels of work. But certainly, as I say, the primitive nature of our uh, wastewater systems, footpaths and curb and channel this and the like, uh, certainly a challenge and will be a challenge for our community for some time as we move into a, a time of climatic change. Um, slightly outside of our Takiwa, but uh, we also uh, have some concerns in relation to the entrance points and exit points of, uh, of the peninsula, um, particularly around uh, Portsmouth Drive, uh, Anderson's Bay, and uh, there is a need in the long term, both for public transport, but also for visitors and uh, the community, in the way that this road and this portion of the road is actually managed, and a longer term solutions to um, the increased traffic volume caused by tourism and in growth. And we do need to look at that quite, quite seriously. Um, Tauriauni Beach, uh, we've worked tirelessly with the community there and uh, also with Port Otago and I'm pleased to say we've made some fantastic progress also with um, staff. Just take the opportunity to say that it's really fantastic to have staff turn up on um, uh, Labor Day weekend, take their weekend <coughs> off and actually come and present to the community and that was a real credit to them and thank you for that and this, the community also uh, were very appreciative of that. And of course, we're now at the design and development phase of that with staff, um, and the commitment of the council in relation to the reserve development has, is, a, is a huge bonus for us in our partnership with Port Otago. The peninsula is obviously a critical area in relation to biodiversity and endangered biodiversity, and of course, it would, it would be lax of me not to discuss the need to continue on with the funding of the control of pest plant and animal species. Critically, like Scott, we also feel that the council need to take the leadership role in coastal dune uh, protection and management, including places such as Tomahawk. Um, in a time where the government are looking to plant a billion trees, 100,000 trees on the Otago Peninsula, on council reserves in the Otago Peninsula would go a long way to helping biodiversity, but also helping the sequestration of carbon. 
And, and as I asked last time, uh, it would be a goal of this council to look at the microchipping of all domestic cats on the Otago Peninsula by 2023. It's that old chestnut again, the Tomahawk School, and I again, once, I, once again, after some progress in the, 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 um, uh, the workshop that we had with councillors last year, we've made some progress, and we're working away on that. However, uh, there is still a need to ensure that as that progresses, we look to provide the funding for the Grants Braze Hall redevelopment. If that is to replace uh, the current facilities that we have there as the major community hub. Um, and that also involves uh, the demolition and rehabilitation of the old school site and the earthquake strengthening and capital investment in grant sprays as well. Also we need to look at the rationalisation of the domain hall site. These are tricky things that have the community have been incredibly patient about over the last five or six years but we are making some progress but it needs your support both financially and politically. Um, <clears throat> one of the areas that uh, is of some concern is our investment in social, ecological and tourism research on the Otago Peninsula. And um, one of the things that we feel that we really could do with is better understanding both of the industry and the effects of the industry on our environment and on our community. Um, we have at the moment a um, the University of Otago Tourism uh, Department. It seems uh, incredible to me that we're not um, partnering them in a much deeper way, especially um, with the opportunity for postgraduate research, which um, in all honesty is probably cheap as chips, but a real opportunity for us to develop internships and get students out in the field working with real communities and doing real research. And that includes things such as uh, impacts, but also on freedom camping and that sort of thing as well. The Otago Peninsula Track Network, as I've said before, is a world-class uh, visitor and community asset. It is uh, absolutely uh, one of the most wonderful walking areas of the city. Um, and one of amongst many walking areas amongst the city, I must say. But to be fair, um, its level of maintenance, signage, interpretation, advertising leaves a lot to be desired. And in fact, what we're actually doing is missing out, uh, both from a tourism and business perspective, but also from a community and recreation health perspective. There's a real opportunity here that we continue to ignore at a peril, in my view, and the board submits that it's time that we worked towards actually looking at having this into a capital programme. It's not expensive. We already have, thanks to the hard work of staff and intern, doing research in the Parks and Recreation Department on the peninsula tracks. That information will be absolutely critical to a future programme for the, for the improvement of these areas. We are a coastal community, the Otago Peninsula, and uh, people have plied trade, transport and, uh, and leisure on the Otago Harbour for nearly a thousand years. Um, but accessibility and infrastructure in some of our um, uh, coastal areas and some of our recreational sites are limited at some, st at some points, and there is a need for us to move forward and accept challenges that the 21st century brings in relation to um, marine uh, leisure and uh, recreation. And particularly critical are areas such as McAndrew Bay, Portobello and Wellers Rock. And while the road work uh, continues at Portobello and that will make some change, there is still work to be done. And particularly on the importance of Wellers Rock as a site that the Otaka Runanga have significance of and um, have real concerns about. So we would submit that in the longer term we need to work and raise the standard of these sites uh, for, the, for the benefit of users and the safety of users, but also pr critically for the environment and for the health of the harbour. Public toilets uh, are also one of those things. As a tourism destination, we need investment in infrastructure. And critically, McAndrew Bay, the old hall toilets there, which are the only public toilets there, have not had an upgrade since they were built in the early 1970s. Uh, Tomahawk 2 now is also um, under severe pressure as people move away from uh, Ocean Beach Domain and towards Tomahawk as an easier accessible site. Rubbish bins and recycling options are something that are constantly asked for in the tourism sector and also interpretation, cultural information projects and even art and infrastructure as we move now towards the completion of the roading works. 
and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Questions, councillors? Councillor Lord. I was just wondering, Paul, if you wanted to make a comment more specifically about Hiraweka. You're obviously a trustee on that, but um, how do you feel that's gone? So the Hiraweka site, 320 hectares of some of the hilliest country you'll find. Uh, it's a real challenge. Uh, we have a successful partnership with our, um, with our leasee and who's farming that land. But to be honest, um, we have also inherited some fairly major capital issues, particularly around tree management, heritage management and physical access. And um, we are limited uh, as a trust uh, from that perspective, and I'm speaking with my trustees hat on now, um, we are limited in, in, in the, some of the things that we are actually able to do with that land. And um, some of it is, doesn't necessarily involve capital, some of it involves expertise, so that provides um, opportunities for us to, um, to push forward and, and make progress and make the site accessible and safe. Councillor Allen. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, thanks for, for your report, Paul. Um, with the track network development, what do you see as the way forward? Well, what we um, the Parks and Rec were the only department last year who got an intern for the summer, and the intern has made some fantastic um, investigation and some uh, analysis of that, and we look forward to seeing that perhaps in February. The key issues that came out of that, and unfortunately Gareth Jones, who's now leaving the council, unfortunately he was part of this too. Um, the key issue with that was first of all looking at which of the physical aspects of the track needed to be maintained and, and, and looking at some of the estimates around that. And then the second part was looking at an interpretation program from that as well. One of the things with the tracks is they are, they are public legal road on a, surrounded by private land um, and there are also tracks that are done within partnership one of the things that we need is a standard, a, a, a one-shop standard between the Department of Conservation and the DCC. And what we need to do, and I, I hate to use this word, but we need a destination brand. We actually need a brand that says, this is the Otago Peninsula, this is the Otago Peninsula tracks, this is the experience that you're going to have. So that would be one of the first things I'd be looking at. Um, with the infrastructure needed for the peninsula for tourism, but also domestic as well, I suppose. Yep. Many of us love the peninsula and visit there often. Um, we have uh, the Tourism Infrastructure Fund out there. Is there any thought of applying for that? Or? You know, one of the things that I find is a, for me is, is how to access that. The, the, there's these sort of... Um, and I, one of the things I said before is that I think board chairs, and in fact boards in general, should actually, we need to workshop and know how we can actually access that. Because I frankly don't actually know how to do it. Okay. And I don't even know when the dates are or when that sort of thing. We actually need to know that. I, I'm aware that um, staff have been looking at some of those options. Yes, but to be honest, that has to be, some of those things I think need to be directed by, um, by the boards. But we need to know more about it. Okay, so a workshop or something? Yep. Okay. Um, what was the other thing? Um, there is a $1 billion, as Shane Jones has said, a $1 billion tree programme um, available. Have you looked at that? I'm about to very soon. I'm actually going to Wellington uh, in a couple of weeks' time to, to look at that very, that very option and to see what options that might provide for community groups in Otago. Um, and that comes... Really, pretty shortly for me, yeah. Oh, awesome. So I am on to that one. Oh, okay. All the best with that. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Thank Hawkins. You. Thank you for all your work done. Kia ora, Paul. Looking forward to Mr Pope goes to Wellington. <laughs> um, on the, I mean, you mentioned the, or you, you, the tourism department specifically, but variations on the theme yep. of how can we use yep. the tertiary sector as a free or cheap consulting service yep. comes up in, in many different um, fora, but I'm just interested in whether you had any specific suggestions around a, what a model might look like, rather than you know, picking off projects. Yep. Are yep. you aware of models of like, ongoing models I, where we can do this more successfully? Yeah, look, I was sort of thinking that um, perhaps what we, if we had a small, small package of money, 
um, there was two things. One is that boards and council could actually set priorities as to what they think some of those priorities are and throw those out as sort of almost like consultancy packages to students to say, well, are you interested in this and to run it from that point? Um, and um, sort of set some priorities within our, both within our own destination and, and, and um, environmental side of things as well. But um, yeah, it does need a bit of work, I must admit. It's, but it, it is something, I mean, we've got a tourism department both in the Polytech and in the university. Um, and it seems to me that rather than looking at cheap labour, we should be looking at actually sharp minds and, and the idea of having young people with a different focus and a different way of thinking perhaps about some of those issues. Yeah, thanks, which goes some way to answering my second question. So you would be supportive of there being a budget, and I don't have a figure yeah, as to yeah. what it would be, to support, not, and not just tourism, but Almost ecology it, or zoology? Yeah, or look, it could be a whole range of things. I mean, one of the things that, you know, for the freedom camping thing, perhaps looking at more about the information about the people who come here, what they spend, that kind of stuff, the nights they stay. I mean, some of that information. Other things about the effects on, you know, some of our special areas, even getting community views within Dunedin about what they think about tourism, how it works, how it works for them, what they see as the issues around infrastructure or anything else like that. Um, and I don't know, maybe, you know, I don't think it would be hugely expensive. It might be a longitudinal project, perhaps over two years. The idea of fitting it into a postgraduate diploma or even a master's. Uh, something as well, um, and having a real body of work that we can actually build on and build on and make smart decisions around, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, thank you, Paul, for a um, comprehensive report. I've got two questions. The first one is just to get a sense from you about how you see community coping with um, feedback of on the road widening project as it's being rolled out. Through the busy uh, well, um, we have 3,200 people on the peninsula. Over a third of those people follow the board on Facebook. Uh, so we have, I think it's 1,100 followers. Um, and one of the things that we've done really well with your communication staff and with Richard and the contractor is actually feed that information out using social media. And that has been actually a really successful way of doing it. The second thing is that um, Fulton Hogan particularly have embraced our community networks of newsletters and websites. And they're actually using those local bases of information to actually feed out information. The second thing is that they've been smart. I mean, the signs they put up like, slow down, my dad works here. Slow down, my mum works here. Fantastic. Great advertising, clever, makes people think. Um, they've also embraced other aspects of the community, other groups in the community. So we've been pretty good about actually the way that, um, they've been pretty good about the way that actually they've communicated with um, as the project goes. Um, in terms of the future, that is in terms of what are the next stages, um, I, can't, I can't say what that will be because that's going to be between council and its contractors, but I'm still pretty happy with the way that we've done that and the rationale. You know, if we take, for example, why they did Broad Bay to Portobello, why that was given to the, why that was, how that was sold to the community and told to the community, there was nothing wrong with that and I was generally pretty happy with that. So the question I had though was, what feedback do you get from the community about the rollout? Is um, there general patience and tolerance? Uh, very good, yep, patience has been pretty good. Um, uh, someone complained to me about having a flat tyre, I said, join the club. Uh, because I live out there and I've had two flat tyres on my bike and two flat tyres on my truck. So, um, you know, that's just part and parcel of living out there. And so, um, you yeah, know, that happens. Um, What's been really interesting is that Fulton Hogan have been very willing to talk to locals and communicate about things as well. So, you know, I'm pretty happy. Feedback's been good. And my second question, thanks for that. And my second question is around um, the sense you get from the community uh, about tourism growth. So we're at a stage where we've got large numbers and it continues to grow. What sense do you get from the community um, about that? Uh, look, I, I get some negative, um, but it's mainly around, you know, rubbish, uh, parking, road conditions, um, you know, driver behaviour, that kind of stuff. The, the sort of, a, I guess, the clickbait kind of stuff. Um, and that comes about a lot, and that's one of the reasons I focused on, as I say, public toilets, rubbish bins, that sort so of stuff. So the everyday stuff. practical yep, yep, that kind of stuff. Here. Those are the kind of things that people um, say. Um, other than that, people in the peninsula are actually fairly tolerant around tourism, to be honest. They're used to it. They're, they're used to it. Um, there's still a few people that 
more than the old days, perhaps when the peninsula was a little bit quieter. Um, but everyone's like that, to be honest. Um, I think if we continue to improve infrastructure and deal with um, community needs and rather than just their wants, then I think we'll be fine. Thank you. Councillor Newell. Thank you, Worship. Thank you very much, Paul, for your presentation. Congratulations to you and your team on the win with the, uh, the bus as well. Thank you. I believe it's going very, very well. Um, just a question regarding freedom camping. I know it's been a, a bit of an issue in the past. How is that this season? For us, it's been okay. Uh, to be honest, um, you know, we're slightly different in, our, in, in the community in this fact that our community at the last bylaw said that we weren't, we didn't want freedom camping in residential areas, and that was came through from the community, and that has been good. The monitoring of freedom camping from the council has also been fairly good from its contractors, um, and although we still have the odd hot spot from time to time, it hasn't been too bad. And the feedback we've had from local accommodation providers and others has been that we've had a reasonably good year. So. Look, I, at the moment, I think what you've done is, is probably working, um, and um, certainly it's taken some of the pressure off. Um, and I think it's just one of those things we just keep monitoring, keep working, keep informing people of what's going on and seeing where we go from there. Any further questions? Thank you very much, thank Paul. You. And no. thank, you, thank you for the presentation. No worries. Um, Waikowaiti Coast Community Board, Alastair Morrison. Welcome, Alastair. Hello, good morning. Nice to see you all again. Happy New Year, and thank you for the invitation to come along. We'll set the stopwatch. Firstly, some really good news. For the past 10 years, I've sat here asking for funding for a public toilet in Waitati. And I am pleased to be able to tell you that it's finally happened. The resource and building consents came through just before Christmas, and uh, DCC funding was signed off a couple of weeks ago. Site preparation has started. Orders have been placed for all the equipment, and we hope to complete this by the end of March. And what's very pleasing is that all of the work is being carried out by local contractors. Because we're in Waitati, we thought we might open it in sort of Waitati style. You know, there would be a ribbon cutting by a special dignitary. And we thought we would have a raffle. And uh, the proceeds of the raffle would go to a good cause. But the prize for the raffle would be first use of the facility. And this would happen in conjunction with the ribbon cutting and perhaps the Waitati militia and the like. So more news of that later on and your invitation to purchase a raffle ticket will be in your email box. Perhaps we can have a long paper roll of ribbon. No problem at all. <laughs> already in hand. Still good news is on the subject of freedom camping. The last time I spoke to you, I asked that a working party be set up and I asked that additional camping sites could be opened up within the city. And now both of these have come to pass. Since the Thomas Burns site was opened, vehicle numbers in Warrington have dropped by 35%. But we're still getting up to 60 vehicles a night. Our busiest period normally happens in February, so we'll see what happens over the next few weeks. The Thomas Burns site only holds 65 vehicles, and it's chock-a-block full on many occasions, so it can only do so much. And we'd ask that in this annual plan, funding provision is made for additional sites in the city. If you visit the Thomas Burns site around six or seven o'clock in the evening, you'll see that at least three quarters of the vehicles are empty because the tourists are uptown, spending money in shops or pubs or restaurants. And it emphasizes what we've said in the past, that these people are not bludging parasites as some letters to the editor would have us believe. They are a vital part of the tourist economy. And if you look at the camper mate app that these tourists have on their phones, there is a place there where these tourists can place comments. And if you look at the comments for Warrington and for Thomas Burns, these foreign tourists are very, very complimentary about Dunedin City Council and all they've done. And this camper mate app now translates comments from French and German and Dutch. So it's worth reading because it will give you warm fuzzies. So well done on that. But we do need more areas in town. Still in good news, the plantation restoration along Matanaka Drive in Waikowiti is coming along nicely. 
planting continued through the spring and it will continue again in the autumn. Maintenance has been carried out. And with the wet weather we've had over the last couple of months, things are growing nicely. The mayor and I were present in late August when the Waikowaiti school children uh, took part in planting hundreds of trees that were part of the Matariki to Rakao <coughs> program. And uh, you'll be delighted to know that the trees we saw them plant, they were this high, well now they're this high. So it's really good. And it's, a, it's an area that's well worth visiting. The tracks that were formed last year are well used by the locals and it really is a very nice place. In years gone by, we would receive in December what was called a Christmas pact, pack rather, and this contained all the facts and figures relating to the annual plan. It used to be a great big thick folder that then got a bit narrower. Nowadays, we don't get anything, but you should see in the figures that you have that there's around $100,000 for the final capping of the Waikowaiti landfill. This project's running about a year behind, project, behind schedule, but I understand it is due to be complete before the end of this financial year. And there's a similar amount in the budget for the, the remedial work on the whole area there uh, relating to the transfer station. And that's uh, underway at the moment. A lot of it had to do with health and safety. Alongside these things, we've got the enthusiastic group of volunteers who are working towards the creation of a resource recovery centre. And this group's recently taken on a part-time experienced <coughs> waste minimisation startup facilitator using some funds that were part of place-based funding granted to the POWA organisation. And I would like some additional funding made available to this group. They're currently known as Waikowaiti Waste Busters, and they're doing a marvellous job to create something that can be a showpiece on resource recovery and ways in which you can repurpose things that other people don't want. It's going to be a shining light as the years go ahead, but it can't run for nothing. The Reserves and Beaches bylaw came into force on the 30th of April last year, but it appears that as you signed this off, little thought had gone into public education or signage relating to changes from the previous bylaw. While the bylaw wants to ban vehicles from the beaches, you can't really go telling someone who has been driving along a beach at low tide for the past 40 years to get a few shellfish for supper that they can no longer, thou shalt not drive on the beach. You can't do that without explaining why. So we need to do a little bit more on public education. I attended a meeting in December with park staff, dock staff, and the team who look after signage, and I've been asked to be part of a working group who will be looking into this issue in detail. And I would request that funding consideration is given to the issue of public education as you consider this annual plan. It's very important that people know why. Work is continuing on the design for remediation of the spit at Karatani Harbour, which got washed away almost exactly a year ago. No maintenance had been carried out on the previous remediation, which was carried out after the 2001 very expensive storm event. And I would ask that budget constraints don't get in the way of the best engineering solution, the design of which will soon be complete. Up in the North Coast area, there's a great deal of frustration about poor bus services. Previous conversations with the ORC staff came to nothing, and I understand that discussions are or will be taking place between DCC and ORC regarding the operation of bus services. We would very much support a change from what exists at present, and we'd be happy to provide some details about how we feel that the service up our way could be improved. There was an item in our 10-year plan submission that related to the fact that there is no reticulated sewage system in Waitati. Some preliminary costings had been looked at as the waste services people were looking into upgrades for the Waikowaiti and the Warrington schemes, and I would ask that the proposal for a sewage scheme for Waitati does not fall off the radar. And just a couple of things as we finish, even though they're not in our board area. When I was up in Wellington a few weeks ago, I had a shot on one of these lime electric scooters, and I was most impressed with the technology. And it occurs to me that it wouldn't be too difficult for these clever people to be able to put a digital GPS fence around areas which are not suitable for these machines, such as along George Street shopping area or Baldwin Street or the likes. They can do press a few buttons and make sure the electric motor doesn't go in certain areas. So perhaps some consideration could be given to this. And secondly, just a word about the proposed development possibilities for the steamer basin. I was actually part of the steamer basin working party in 1992, 
which was chaired by Councillor John Bizet, as I recall. And around that time, for nine years, I was manager of a large engineering company located at the end of Birch Street. And we operated the slipway right at the end. And we were busy in those days. Our workforce numbered between 40 and 100, depending on workload. And our workers had a name for that part of the city. It was called Pleurisy Point. And it was called Pleurisy Point because for large parts of the year, the weather can be absolutely diabolical down there. Now, I don't wish to denigrate your current thoughts or potential designs, but I would like to suggest that weather considerations should be part of the conversation when looking at any future design work. I'm here in my 21st year as a community board member, and over the years I've sat here speaking on many topics, but we don't seem to be getting much feedback as to whether our requests or ideas have actually been incorporated into the annual or long-term plans, or if not, why not? And perhaps this is something that could be improved. And almost finally, the Blue Skin Show, show, the Blue Skin show will be held on Sunday the 7th of April, and as always, we will have our community board gazebo there, together with annual plan consultation materials and various staff will be along, and you're all invited to come along and participate in this. And finally, finally, we've got a roading issue that's developing as we speak. Coast Road between Evansdale and Caratani is on the move. And I noticed it even more so last night as I was driving up to a community board meeting. A large part of the road fell away in late August. They just decided it didn't want to be there and it dropped by this much, a large area. And the repairs to that are still ongoing. They're not complete. The road's down to one lane with traffic light controls. Another slump appeared uh, just south of Warrington. And there are other areas that have suddenly dropped and little ridges are appearing on the road. So I'm going to be doing a drive around with the transportation staff next week. But I got a feeling that this is going to give a feral nudge to the transportation repair budget. So be aware. And that's me. Bang on time. Thank you, Alistair. And just on the subject of Lime Scooters, the very uh, uh, proposal that you're, you've suggested is being discussed as we speak. Good. That's really good. Questions, councillors? Councillor Roman. Hi, Alistair. Good to see you again eight hours later. Um, you may suggest, you may have spotted a theme here um, in terms of the community boards and their ability to influence annual plans and long-term plans, and I'd ask Alistair to bring that up at today's meeting. Can I ask you, um, the money for the Waikawaiti Waste Busters to do their components, do you want to submit that as a formal um, request to yeah, the Yeah, we don't have an actual figure for you. It started off, we, we sat at a public meeting about two years ago now to speak about the whole plantation thing, Botanica Drive, and the idea of the Resource Recovery Centre. And from that, a volunteer group was formed, and they are very, very enthusiastic. And there's a local lady who chairs that, and she's doing a marvellous job. And they're meeting once a month, and Councillor O'Malley and one of our board members goes along to that to, to keep the whole thing bubbling along. And now that we've got this lady employed, she used to work for the council as the facilitator, things are going to be on the move. They're, the first thing is we've given them some funding to produce information leaflets uh, just to let the community know what's happening. But uh, they're looking to provide a shop area on the main street where uh, people can you know, bring stuff and repurpose them and do all that kind of business. So, we expect this to go a long way, but we don't have the actual figure. But if you had five or ten thousand dollars you didn't actually need, then throw it my way. So we'll just send it to Sharon as as an official. Not yep. it's not really a motion, but it's a it's a request from the community board for yep. consideration right. the annual plan. Frame it as a as a resolution and uh, okay. send it to Sharon. Cool. Okay. Further questions, councillors. Run on. Thank you very, very much. Very um, comprehensive presentation. Thank you. Alice. Enjoy the rest of your very warm day. I was just going to ask one question. Fire okay. away. Sorry. Mm. Uh, this is um, I was just wondering, um, you know, had you not come off? Oh, I was just wondering, um, I suppose with Paul Pope, had you looked at the One Billion Trees? Project. Well, with our plantation uh, in Botanica Drive, there's between 35 and 40,000 trees going in there anyway oh, as okay. part of the project. Because when the forest was felled, the funds from that are locked away for this oh, particular okay. project to buy all the plants, plant the plants, maintain the plants. So that's going to be an indigenous forest 
that Which will be fantastic. created in the process of being created. And over the next few years, it will be growing up, and we've got community involvement in that. We've got the schools involved, and there will be wee plaques saying, I planted this and whatever. And that's really going to be a community planting thing. Ah, oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Okay, that's uh, Right, councillors. The final presentation from the community board chairs is from the chair of the Mosgill Tidy Community Board, um, Sarah Nitas. And she can't be with us till uh, 10 o'clock. Um, that's when she, as, as I understand it. Um, so I suggest, um, in the interest of getting as much done as we can, we move to item eight, the waste management budget. Uh, with the understanding uh, and, um, and the tolerance of staff that we will break into that uh, and allow uh, Sarah to speak when she gets here and then return to it. So um, I think uh, if um, Mr Henderson and Mr Drew are available. Yeah. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. And we and deal with them. Okay. Well, we'll do that. Yeah. Right. Welcome. Now, we will get as far through this as we can, and then we'll um, break for um, Ms. Nitas, and then we'll come back to it. Um, so, um, we're on item. We're on item eight, councillors. So, um, would you like? Uh, I'll open it up for questions of Mr. Henderson and Mr. Drew uh, on item eight, which is waste management. Right, sorry, Council, uh, Councillor Law. Yeah, look, I just had a question, Chris, and I'm just wanting you to explain it to me so I don't, um, I'm not complaining about price or anything, but I just noticed, for example, like a ute load of green waste, 100% green waste. So I just happened uh, to take a ute load of 100% green waste to the tip in um, Wanaka recently, and it was a good load, and they weighed me up, they put me over the scales and charged me $7.20, and it was massive was the whole section's cut back for a year. And I'm just wondering, is there something we're doing different? I did read that $10 a tonne has to go to the ETS, so obviously I wasn't charged that in Wanaka, and I'm just wondering what's the difference, or do you know a difference? Uh, the main difference between um, Green Island Landfill and, um, Green Island Landfill is a, is a class one landfill, so we do have to pay waste levy and emissions trading scheme charges. Anything other than a class one landfill doesn't have to pay those those fees. Um, so we're automatically going to be more expensive than other options uh, because we take metropolitan waste. Um, so it's, yeah, we're at a disadvantage in, in, a, in regards to pricing mechanism um, for a competitive purpose, and not that landfills are competitive. But yeah, but we are at a disadvantage in the fact we, uh, it's only really councils that own metropolitan landfills that have to pay ETS and waste levy. So they are avoiding paying those charges because they're not class one? Yeah, uh, so well they they, they, they're not required to pay those charges yeah. unless you're a class one landfill. Yeah, okay. And what would you normally expect to pay? It's just at $10 a tonne. Uh, oh, for the, the waste levy is ten dollars a ton, and the ETS is uh, it is actually oh, I, can't, I couldn't actually give you a figure off the top of my head. Sorry, and a similar it's, amount. It is approximately similar amount. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. No, it's it's twenty five dollars right. for an emission unit. Yeah. So just for the councillor's benefit, so the ETS uh, price per ton is currently twenty five dollars. Um, there are changes in the legislation that is likely to see that. So that's a cap at the moment, effectively. So the market's pretty much hit the cap. There is talk of obviously that levy being increased and I mean effectively the sky's the limit in terms of where that levy may end up. I mean there's talk of at least doubling it to $50. So that's obviously not a cost to council. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks Chris. Okay, uh, Councillor Newell. Thank you, Worship, and uh, thank you, Mr. Henderson, Mr. Drew. Um, just uh, regarding that, um, there was um, talk of uh, 
regulation being enforced on some of the other landfills which would even the playing field. Is that, is that got anywhere? Is there, is there any, any progress with that? Um, I think we might be talking about the um, Otago Regional Council with the permitted activity. Um, we have had some progress, um, GM has had some progress, had some meetings with Otago Regional Councils where they've agreed to work collaborative, collaboratively with us on that issue. Um, no significant progress as yet, but um, we are at least now talking about it. Yeah. Nice. Um, just a second, also uh, regarding the way bridges, are we still looking at, at that in the near future? Uh, so the way bridge for Green Island landfill um, was basically on hold at the moment pending the Waste Futures project because uh, we want to actually have an idea of how we're going to, how that site will be developed before we uh, stick in extra infrastructure into the site. Thank you. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Worship. Mr Henderson, I just want a clarification on um, paragraph two, and it talks about the reduction in refuge bag sales of 500k due to increased competition in the collection of domestic waste. Could you just uh, compare for me the cost um, for a, a resident of uh, going with the council's collection service versus a private collection service. My understanding is it's quite a lot different and quite a lot cheaper to go privately. How, what's the difference? Can you clarify that for me, please? Uh, it would, depends entirely on how much rubbish you actually create. The, I understand that the um, commercial providers at the moment have actually recently put up their prices quite significantly. Um, however, for a uh, commercial rubbish bin, you pay a fixed fee per month. Um, fill it up to the brim once a week for collection. Obviously the rubbish bags are pay as you go. So um, for a large family that wants to produce a lot of rubbish, it's much cheaper to use a, uh, a, a private service. For a pensioner, one person pensioner or something who's only creating it, it puts one rubbish bag out a month, it's much cheaper to use the council bags. Councillor Hawkins. Thank you, Bishop. Um, and frustrating that the review of the scope of our curbside collection um, won't, come, won't take effect until 1 July 2022 at the earliest per this report, but I understand the reasons for that. Um, but in the interim, I'm just wondering um, if staff have sought clarification on whether uh, our curbside collection, which is built upon single-use plastic bags, uh, is affected by uh, the legislative changes around the use of single-use plastic bags and the phase-out of those? Uh, actually, no, it's not. Um, the phase-out of single-use plastic bags is around point, uh, around point of sale. It's for um, shops commercial when they provide a bag with something sold. That it doesn't actually cover things like rubbish bags uh, for our collection service. Thank you. Councillor Vanders. The costs of dumping rubbish at the Green Island landfill um, is something that I've been getting a number of complaints about. The um, uh, rules regarding a single axle or a double axle trailer and then the difference uh, when you put a trailer over a weighbridge, is that something that staff have discretion over or if you show up with a single axle trailer is, is that $91 charge basically always going to be it? I uh, can't say it's always going to be it. Uh, the fact that we don't actually have an entry way bridge at Grenada Landfill uh, means that we have that um, one charge that applies. The, we can't actually do weight-based weight charging because we don't have the facilities at the landfill to do it, so it's basically just based on uh, the size of the load and whether it's a ute or a trailer or a, a station wagon, etc. Right. It may surprise you to learn that, in fact, that's not what's happening at the tip currently. I took a single axle large trailer load in, which would normally attract a $91 fee. They turned me around, put me on the way bridge, and I ended up with a bill of $410 because there was a couple of tonne on it. And uh, I said that this seemed incredibly high. And, and the guy remarked, well, actually, yeah, it is quite a lot. And we've had three of them uh, uh, through um, today. And it seemed to be the person's discretion whether they classified you as a single axle trailer or put you over the weighbridge. So it might pay for you to check when they use that discretion 
and uh, also the, 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 the issue that you get when you get over $400 charged for dropping a trailer load of rubbish and this being perhaps a contributor to a lot of the country roads ending up with the rubbish just down the bank somewhere. Um, if you could perhaps get back to us and let me know whether or not that staff discretion is regularly used and also if there's anything we can do to um, uh, reduce the perception that it's become unaffordable to take a large load of rubbish to the tip. Councillor Elder. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have two questions. Um, one is actually related to Lee's question, and that is we um, put a charge on dumping and, you know, if people are caught, has there been any increase in dumping and has anybody been charged? Uh, no, so no, uh, we have not issued any infringements. We have uh, issued a number of um, uh, warning letters um, and depending on the level of evidence we've had, we've referred a couple of dumping incidents to the police for follow-up. Um, my understanding is that uh, normally, based on the amount of evidence that's provided, the police usually issue a pre-charge warning to offenders. Uh, but so far, we have not actually issued any infringement notices. Thank you. Um, and in the budget, we've got budgets for project managers and things like that. I was just wondering what project managers you're pre presently got in, in, in your Waste Futures program. Uh, in the Waste Futures program? Mm -hmm. So that's basically the Waste Futures program is using, are you after a figure amount or just what? What's oh, no, job? just who, what kind of project managers you've got there because. Uh, so we're using a project manager with experience in the better business case approach. He came from NZTA uh, because we're using the better business case approach for uh, the whole Waste Futures project. So we're using external project manager on that um, to manage that project. Um, I don't actually have any, uh, I've got one project manager in my team who is concerned with the, delivering that on the capital budget. Okay, thank you. Councillor Wilson. I just that uh, the chair of the Mosgill Committee, uh, committee Board is here. You, you're happy oh, to yes, carry on. No, I appreciate yeah. that. Okay. Um, I want to get through questions and then. First, okay. The, um, we, around this table, we've been quite critical of the Otago Regional Council not uh, and their waste plan, but I note, and it was brought up with staff from the ORC, that we have an, an ability to do waste minimisation bylaws, which would address some of those issues. And I'm just wondering whether we should be or how that would affect the rollout of. Um, of your work program if we moved a motion that we consider a waste minimisation bylaw to address some of the issues that um, has been fallen through because we don't have those that at present? Uh, well, a bylaw would be very useful. However, I've, um, I'd put a caution on that that until we have actually completed the Waste Futures project and develop what our future collection model is going to look like, um, it would be better to actually in, uh, investigate a bylaw once that model has been established um, so that we can actually make sure it covers uh, everything, we, everything we want it or need it to. Um, so I think it might be a little bit premature to, uh, to go for a bylaw at, the, at this present time. You wouldn't see it as an interim step to address some of the uh, other issues where we've talked about today that there's um, legal dumping elsewhere to manage that pro 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 uh, No, I don't see it having a significant benefit at this point in time, no. Okay. Councillor O'Malley. Thanks very much for the presentation. I just want to quickly look at the 1.1 million for the Waste Futures Project. Um, can you tell me how that's broken down relative to consultation, well, consulting fees versus, um, is there any, you've got landfill and resource recovery facilities, is that just simply design that we're talking about that's carried in that 1.1 million or any capital works? Uh, no, there's no capital works in that. That is pretty much entirely consultant budget. It's. Uh, Approximately $200,000 to, uh, or $100,000, $200,000, somewhere in the area to do a full detailed business case for design of a new uh, waste management system and actually carrying that uh, through to actually a fully costed uh, financial model and, a, and a, a full management model, which includes the possibility of the designated Smooth Hill site. Um, most of the rest of the of that funding is actually with detailed site investigations, so geotechnical investigations, etc., with the Smooth Hill site. 
as well as investigating options for extending the life of the Green Island site uh, to cover any delay in, in uh, finding an alternative waste disposal facility. And so that ties in with the expected delivery date of July 2022 with curbside collection? Uh, that date is mainly around the fact that it, uh, we need to get the model developed, then go, uh, we would need to then go to the, get the funding in the, uh, amended into the long-term plan, go to the market and then give a um, substantial amount of time to any new contract provider to actually establish and, pro and provide the services. Um, if we're providing additional services, obviously we need the infrastructure in place as well as delivering 50,000 bins or whatever we want to do. So it actually takes a considerable amount of time to, to get the infrastructure in place. So that we expected some build ahead of that. And the reason I'm actually taking this rather circular set of questions is I'm getting back down to the fees eventually. Um, the second Weybridge at the landfill, do we, have we purchased that Weybridge? Are we, is it a matter that we've got a Weybridge sitting somewhere and we haven't installed it or we've not done anything yet? Uh, no, we had one, we basically rented a second Weybridge for a period of time while we did a full refurbishment of our existing Weybridge. Um, and at that point, because of the Waste Futures project, there was a potential option to buy it, um, but we didn't take that up at the time. On the idea that you didn't know how the design would look f going forward, I guess my question is how many years between now and that new design being implemented would pass um, against the investment of putting the second way bridge in now as it relates to how we're charging people for using the, the landfill? Um, so I, mean, I guess my question is how long do you think it would be if you were to put them down and then you're going to have to tear them up and move them somewhere else because you're going into a new design, how many years do you think are going to pass between doing that now and, and then moving them for a new design? Roughly. Three to five. Yeah, three to five. Yeah, so I guess I'd cons so this is another question now, <laughs> statement. I would like you to consider whether or not, in fact, there would be a good return on investment to consider putting those way bridges in now. That's not a question. I said it wasn't. Um, but it's probably better to get it now than in discussion, because I just want your answer to this point. Um, do you think that would not be such a bad idea? Uh, yeah, well, it would certainly obviously take away some of the uh, uh, discussion around landfill fees. Yeah, yeah great, thanks. Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's partly picking up on Councillor Van Vis's point to begin with. Our um, financial liabilities, if you like, with regard to landfill are based on mass rather than volume, is that right? So the ET, our ETS liabilities are based on tonnage rather than space? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. So the weight of your load would be a more accurate reflection of costs yeah. than the size of your trailer would be? Yeah, yeah, it's the, it's the type of load and the, and the, the weight, yeah. So yeah. basically a lot, of, a lot of it is obviously based on average weights, which are actually provided from the yeah, Ministry for the Environment, yeah. And just in the interest of institutional knowledge, um, is it uh, is, is it a f is my recollection correct that staff recommended to council that the second Weybridge uh, be purchased, but council voted against that decision? Uh, the previous council. Uh, that's correct. Yes. Thank you. Any further questions? Right. Well, well. Pause there. We've done questions, and um, can I ask you just to wait, and we'll um, see, uh, hear from the last community board chair, and then we'll come back to this. Ms. Nitas, Tyra, uh, Tyra community board chair, welcome. Thank you, and happy New Year. Good to be able to come and uh, take this opportunity to talk with you as you uh, debate this annual plan. I'm here representing the Mosgiltari Community Board by majority, of course, as, um, and we wish to raise a few points. <laughs> yes. <coughs> yes. Not a main common problem. <laughs> On behalf of residents uh, living over the hill in the microclimate of the Torrey Plain, which I might add is currently very hot, as is the rest of the country. Now I'm going to try and do this without shaking. There we are. So just an overview of the points that I'd like to raise this morning. I want to talk a wee bit about capital investment and infrastructure, the operational budgets in communities, 
key directions for the community board this year and um, just a bit about the dual role that we see us performing as community board. So looking at capital investment in infrastructure, this annual plan is fundamentally consistent with the long-term investment plan of 2018 and as such the community board my, by majority supports the plan. Uh, we've identified areas requiring focused infrastructural investment and they're getting attention. Specifically the aquatic facility, it's fantastic to see the progress being made in this project. Community fundraising efforts have been outstanding and obviously the major expenditure for the city will occur over the next two years and it's fingers crossed we'll be togs on for 2021 and we're all really working forward to that end. A stormwater and wastewater network upgrades, these are underway with capacity being added to two key pumps. Further investment to bring forward an extensive pipe renewal programme would be gratefully received. Got to ask for these things. Um, the board is also encouraged to see an investment programme for the Dunedin Tunnels Trail. As we've said before, this trail is identified as a key project of significance for our community not only providing a recreational trail with a key point of difference, but an appealing transport option for residents commuting to town. Looking at operational budgets in the community, here we just wanted to highlight to you the value of these operational budgets to local ratepayers. Firstly, the budget relating to the maintenance of parks and recreation spaces across the city. A poorly mown playground or field, a roundabout with dead plants, overflowing rubbish bins, a lane covered in leaves or debris. <laughs> these are relatively small things, but these are the things that ratepayers notice on a day-to-day -day basis. Secondly, the board wonders if there shouldn't be a greater budgetary emphasis on the auditing function across key contracts specifically in the parks and recreation and transportation work areas. Personally, there's nothing worse than paying for a job that is inadequate or incomplete. And as a ratepayer, it's no different. Thirdly, looking at the budget which supports activities and events being possible at the community level. We'd like to flag that as health and safety expectations change and compliance costs increase, it's becoming harder and harder for communities to hold events, large or small. As such, additional support is required to ensure communities are able to come together to celebrate identities and to build connectedness and resilience. So some key directions for the board in 2019. In many ways, it's hard to believe how quickly this triennium is passing. Uh, we're now essentially on the homeward stretch and it's time for us as a board to really consolidate some of the cool projects we've got underway and we've been working on over the last couple of years. And I thought I'd share some of these with you. We've got our Celebrating Excellence on the Tauri project, which is where we're calling for nominations of local legends that have achieved excellence and brought credit to our area and we really want to celebrate this success. I don't think we do enough of celebrating success. At Pride in Our Place is a programme of activities where we aim to encourage locals to take care of their surroundings and be proud of the areas we call home. Uh, activities promoting picking up litter, minimising waste and maximising recycling. So that's underway toward the end of February as part of the Festival of the Plain. There's the Tauri Heritage Arts Trail, which is still very much in its infancy, but we're looking at facilitating the development of a series of art installations across the Tauri that tell a tale of times gone by. It's a really exciting concept, but it's definitely a, a plan for a number of years as far as the implementation goes there. The aim of the Memorial Park Revitalisation Project is to give a facelift to a tired, underutilised amenity in the area, being the Memorial Park Gardens. And then there's also the Safe Pedestrian Cycle and Scooter Access Ways project, which is well underway. We had a workshop with staff attending last night in, in conjunction with the schools and the 
Board of Trustees and the Community Board. And we're bringing together these groups to develop a series of safe access ways to encourage our residents to walk, cycle or scooter between key destinations. So that's another great project that we've got on the go. And finally, just a reminder uh, of what we see ourselves as the Mosgiel Torrey Community Board, what we've committed to undertake in our role as community board members. We liaise between the community and the City Council, both ways. We feed communications. Oops. There we are. We feed communications, often complaints, some compliments, into the council system. And we also share communications from council out to our community. And this can be of great benefit, particularly around managing residents' expectations of council's roles and performance. For example, I've had many discussions of late about overhanging trees and hedges affecting footpaths. This is actually a private property owner's responsibility. Though some believe the council should be paying for footpaths to be monitored regularly and offending foliage dealt with then and there. Needless to say, this level of service is not covered by our rates. And residents are generally understanding when you have that conversation with them, you explain the process that is in place and then you talk about the actual costs of the alternative that they're proposing. Um, so we do try and work with you as well as against you on the odd occasion. <laughs> um, so that's all I've got. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you. Um, we're happy to take a few questions. Councillor Gary. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that comprehensive report. Um, I just, it was a general question to ask, um, how could we assist you? Uh, you? You've clearly got a really clear vision for the area. You're very clear about your role in relation to council. How could DCC uh, assist you more uh, going forward? I think the training is something that we've asked for um, on a number of occasions, and that training in the formalities of meetings and also just um, more communication, I guess, between ourselves and councillors as to how we can help you. So this is about training of board members, yes. is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with regards to the formalities of meetings, so there are still a couple of members who have been for this triennium, so they're nearing the end, and they're not particularly confident to speak up in a formal meeting. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Lord. Yes, Sarah, I just was referring to your comments about um, uh, weedy roundabouts and poorly made parks and that sort of stuff. Do you have a... I drove through Outram this morning and there was, um, I thought, an excellent, um, well-mowed rugby ground as I drove past. Um, but do you feel that the job around Mosgiel is not being done up to a standard or are you disappointed with it or is it room for improvement? There's definitely room for improvement. Spring is obviously a difficult time for contractors regardless. The, the growth is very much variable depending on the weather, so spring is always going to be a problem area. Um, there have been many occasions where residents have raised what's going on with this specific area. or There is clearly um, a park that has been mown, but the around the trees hasn't been given any attention. Or, you know, that's kind of the incomplete nature of jobs being done. It, it, it's definitely still the case around Mosgiel. So in that regard, <coughs> um, I would do, and I, I note <coughs> what you said about um, tempering residents' expectations of particular types of service, but in that regard, I would urge you to um, pass on complaints or observations about lack of service and by our contractors. We can't sit on their, the side of their tractor. <coughs> we haven't got the staff to do that. But so w when there is a, a perceived lapse, we'd like to know about it. Mm. And that's helpful. And then we can feed it back. So our community board could be, could be helpful in that regard. Yep. So and thank that's you the that. message we give the, staff, uh, the residents to. DCC yeah, that, and DCC. for residents directly. They don't have to go through you. Yeah. Uh, but we need the information before we can take steps. Councillor Elder. 
Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your report. <coughs> hey, I was just ringing, uh, ringing, talking to you about um, the civil defence emergency plans and the work being done around flooding. I was just wanting to get your feedback on that. It's quite a large workload at times. <laughs> it is. Uh, the response group, the Mosgiel Tyra Community Response Group, is a um, fantastic resource for our community and we're very lucky to have a core group of people that are happy to come together when I send a message out and say we need to meet. Um, the, our community <coughs> response guide, the comprehensive one that will be available online, is available online so we've completed that initial community response guide. The larger brief document that we intend to go out to every household that points people to that comprehensive guide is nearing completion and we as a group are working our way to developing a comprehensive manual with SOPs and key community contacts and things and that's really coming together so the work of the group in preparation for responses is, is well advanced uh, and then obviously there is the come together in times of a response and the follow up with communities um, carrying on from responses. There are a number of areas across the Tauri, as you're aware, that are highly affected by rainfall events, and, and that is an ongoing conversation that needs to be had. And what about the work being done about pumps and bits and pieces that, that has been um, over the last couple of years? Yeah, and there's the two issues as far as the stormwater goes, is the urban areas and the rural areas and the, the <coughs> urban areas, you know, working with Tom and the team in Water and Waste, they're definitely working very hard to ensure that that urban area is um, future-proofed. Thank you. So, any, oh, Councillor Gary, sorry. Thank you, Wisha. Um, look, I had another question, Sarah, and, and what triggered it was your comment about workload. Um, as you know, um, community board remuneration is coming up for review at a national level. Um, and I'd be really interested in your comments around workload and, and your role as chair as an example of what's involved. Because it's very clear that you approach this in a very professional way and that you're covering an awful lot of bases in a busy area. So could you just comment on that for us? The workload is as much as you can give time and effort to, really. It is a big pot, and so as far as the workload goes, the challenge is maintaining the balance of, you know, I, I have other commitments, as do other community board representatives generally, so it's about balancing <coughs> the time that you personally are able and willing to contribute to the community versus your other challenges and I would say most community board members would put in a half-time equivalent in a number of cases. And how do you think that uh, contributes to when people stand for, because we're always wanting a wide range of people standing for community boards going forward, um, how do you think that affects the workload and remuneration affects who, is, who can and is prepared to stand, but who's able to stand and also hold down a job? Have you got any comments around that? Yeah, we've got a mix of, I'm not sure, you know, you've obviously got two ways you remunerate um, intending for a um, you know, a, a half-time role or, a, a, or a, the similar to a board of trustees for school or all the likes. And we've got some that contribute immensely for the community board that manage to hold down a full-time job. And they're obviously doing a lot of work in the evenings and weekends. Um, there's others that perform that work during the day. Um, so remuneration is <coughs> part of it but the, you're always going to get people that put their hand up because they're there for the community. It's, you just can't take advantage of those people really is the key, isn't it? No further questions? Sarah, thank you very much for um, coming and presenting. Thanks. Thank you.
just, <clears throat> just make the observation that's the last of the um, community board chair's presentations. And I'll just make the observation that there wasn't one of the requests that was made by all of them, by any of them, that was on the face of it unreasonable. And it points up the challenge that councils have, not just this council, all councils, in um, addressing perfectly legitimate and perfectly reasonable uh, requests for funding and balancing that against the fact that we only have rates and debt to pay for things. And this is a national issue. It's not, a, it's not just confined to Dunedin. Uh, when you add uh, the need to balance up uh, addressing legitimate and reasonable requests from the community with the need to invest in, in future infrastructure as well, it's, it, this is why um, the sector as a whole is saying to government the tools, the financing tools, the funding tools that we have as a sector are simply not sustainable, they're not adequate into the future. They might have been some time in the past, but they're not in the future. Okay, can we get back to um, waste management? Can I welcome back Mr Henderson and Mr Drew? And uh, we're done with questions, so we'll move on to um, the uh, resolutions. Uh, would someone like to move the resolutions or an alternative? Councillor Staines, you're moving. Second, Councillor O'Malley. Thank you. Councillor Staines, do you wish to speak to it? And the first you don't. Councillor O'Malley, do you speak? Um, my issue is not to this resolution, but to something that's not in the long in the annual plan, which also was not in the long term plan, which is the closure of the Green Island landfill and our expected um, liabilities to establish that. I'm deeply concerned that um, as we're going forward, we have a large liability facing the city, which which I had wished had gone into the long term plan, but has not and needs to be held front and centre to us as we go forward, that this liability is very likely to push us near our upper debt limit. And um, I certainly, did. I really cannot emphasise more strongly how much its absence in our consideration is always a concern for me because I think it should be stated first and foremost every time we talk about solid waste, waste management. But other than that, I'm happy with what's in the report. Thank you. Further speakers? If there are none, I'll put it on. Councillor Hall. The um, ETS on your landfill charges is that they stepped up to 25 this month, the increase, is it? Or, or was it January last year? Councillor, we well, we can answer the question, but we're actually in the discussion now. Oh, sorry. We've moved a bit. Yep. Answer the, answer the question. Okay. If, if it's, yeah, so the ETS charge has already been applied in January. The yes. increase, yeah. Yeah, just this, this January. Yeah. Yep. So you haven't added on to your costs. I notice the tip fees haven't increased. Uh, no, the, it was included as basically, for whatever better word, I'll just call it an average um, because the the yeah, increase was happening halfway through, through our financial yeah. year. Yeah. Yeah. It was basically averaged across our financial year. Yeah, that's okay. Time. Okay. No more discussion. I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, had I known it was going to be that short, I might have kept you here a little longer earlier, so sorry to delay you. Um, we're finishing at half past. Um, this might be an appropriate time uh, to break for um, morning tea. Uh, we're breaking for lunch at 12.30. So if we have um, a quarter hour break, break now, it's about bang on. So I'll move that we um, recess, um, break from morning tea. Seconded Councillor Staines, all those in favour please say aye. Again, carry on.